Hello and welcome to the session Story Worlds in cooperation with the Federal Foreign Office, Berlinale Native and Berlinale Forum Expanded. And I'm happy to introduce you to our guests of this conversation. So first of all, there is Sebastian Lignati, um, director, producer and editor from Argentina. <laughs> welcome. He is back here with his documentary, Sip Oi, Mandore Place. Hope I didn't pronounce it badly. And at Berlinale Native. Then we have Madhushri Dutta. She is filmmaker and curator from India. She is one of the pioneers of non-fiction cinema. And she's also part of this year's um, short films jury. Welcome. Next to her is acclaimed filmmaker um, Jean-Pierre Becoleo from, uh, yeah, from, <laughs> from Cameroon. And <laughs> he is here with his latest work, um, Mudimbe's, Mudimbe's um, Order of Things at Forum Expanded. <laughs> Welcome. And Dorothy Weiner, one of our Berlinale Talents friends, and um, she's also a documentary filmmaker involved in the Berlinale as a um, delegate and selection member. So welcome her. <laughs> and enjoy. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, it is also my pleasure to introduce Amalia Cordoba, who is our colleague. She is the consultant to the native section in Berlinale. So, uh, since everyone was briefly introduced, I'm giving you an idea of what we have in stock for today. Um, we will, uh, I will give a little word of introduction of what we thought space would be interesting or which aspects of space would be interesting to look at with this very distinguished panel. And we will do um, a round of introductions so that you know who is here and who is doing what, with particular reference to space as a cultural space, a political space, but also as a place that uh, within uh, filmmaking you better think a lot about who you're working with, how you're working with, how you introduce yourself. So after presenting all three of them and their work with little experts from what they are doing, this will take about half um, the session. We would like to have it very interactive and have you involved into also putting your point of view in what you think is important when it comes to working setups and so on and so forth. So um, space. When, when you look at space, space discovery, we want to look at uh, the vast differences when it comes to working realities that we face, whether we work in Germany, France, Japan, or when you work in places such as Cameroon, India, or Argentina. And uh, how does this influence your work? How does this influence your working situation, but also later on the way of what kind of movies you make? And sometimes I find we a little bit forget uh, the question of who we are actually making these films for. Are we making the films for international festival audiences? And is a good film really only a good film that would be shown here as well as in the respected places? Or are there maybe differences that we should better be aware of and address also? And um, how do we deal with that on all, on all layers of filmmaking? That is from uh, setting up a project, thinking about a project, developing a project, financing a project, and exhibiting a project. So this is what we are dealing with in general. And we thought it might be the most interesting to start with Madhushri, not only because it's a lady's first choice, but Madhushri Dutta, as Andrea has rightly said, so. Uh, is an activist and a filmmaker. And ever since she has been setting up in Bombay, uh, her NGO institution office, which is called Majlis, Majlis is uh, an Arabic word for meeting point, it has always been looking at the gray zone where filmmaking and activism do merge. Many of her projects have developed out of this idea um, in, in bringing together various aspects uh, of legal issues and filmmaking in India. This is a vast topic. We uh, want to focus today on a project that has been going on 
for five years by now. It's called the Cinema City. And Cinema City is kind of a mixed approach. It's uh, having an archival site. She's commissioning work, documentary work. And um, it was presented like the first chapter of it was presented in 2010 here also in Berlin. For a really generous, I may not be worthy of it, introduction. Um, anyway, it's always a pleasure to come and face an audience in Berlin. It's, it's the greatest pleasure for a filmmaker anyway. Well, um, you know, but uh, um, when I first started coming to Berlin, to Europe, I remember that I almost uh, developed a kind of defensive and I used to say, hi, I'm so-and-so, I live in Bombay, I'm a filmmaker, and I don't know anything about Bollywood. Because it is assumed that if you are in Bollywood, uh, if you live in Bombay and if you are a filmmaker, then you know all about it. But it's not possible, it's a nation by itself. And it's not Bollywood, it's Bombay cinema, cinema that Bombay produces. But over the years, my defense actually went off and I actually got interested in this, that what is this, that the cinema that get produced in Bombay? Is it something to do with the land that this produces? Because it cannot call it Indian cinema. Indian cinemas are many. Uh, I mean, we produce cinemas in many other languages. And like any other film producing country, we also make many other genre of films. So Bollywood, the um, happy-go-lucky um, films which are called Bollywood, which are mostly uh, produced in Bombay in a language called Hindi, which is actually not really Hindi, a hybrid language. It's a very product of Bombay. So over the years, I got interested that is it this land which makes that cinema? And then when we go out and people say, oh, you are from Bombay, then you must be part of Bollywood. So I got interested. I'll show you a clip of that. Uh, can you have the first clip, please? No, the film clip.
Well, uh, that is the, uh, literally the back lane uh, of uh, Bombay Cinema. Uh, this is uh, the artist who paints publicity banner by hand. And at an average, he uh, paints 32 feet by 12 feet paintings, eight of them every week. So you can imagine what a prolific hand-painted uh, painter he is. He almost works at an industrial scale, but he does it with hand-painted. That, that, that is the cusp of the uh, space that Bombay Cinema is, actually. The city of Bombay, and in my opinion, of course, I mean, everybody has a take on Bombay Cinema. In the city of Bombay and the cinema that it produces, they're twins, but they're also mirror image. You know, Bombay is not an old city. It's mainly developed in 19, uh, 18th century and mainly 19th century. It was seven islands and be because we needed a port. I mean, internationally a port was needed in that area, so Bombay was created. So Bombay actually was made by people, skill, talent, commodity, and cinema, which came from all over the world. So Bombay cinema is actually one year older than European cinema. It started in 1896. Uh, so, and so through the 19th century, it grew up together. They're like twins, and they copy each other. So whole of India, whole of South Asia, and to some extent, other part of the world also, for them, uh, the concept of modernity urbanity, city, is what Bombay cinema sells them or, or, or multiplies it. So, so, so people come to Bombay uh, to be in the city, and the city that they conceive, they conceive it from the cinema that that city produces. So it's, it's a very circular relationship, city to cinema to cinema to city. And in the middle of this uh, conveyor belt is people who move. So Bombay cinema actually is not a single cinema. It, it, it has got paintings, say, from Indian miniature. It has got music from uh, Persian, uh, a musical instrument from Persian tradition. It has got Aryan feature from Himalayan communities. And it has got uh, body language of uh, south of Bombay. So it, it is a hybrid. In that hybrid, Rehman, people like Rehman lives. If you notice, what he brings in is a pre-modernity, pre-industrial skill that is hand-painted at a very commercial level where there is no author's name, nothing. For six days it is up there and on the seventh day it comes down and it got erased. In an industrial time, an image will be reproduced again and again. It is all about reproduction. Cinema is all about reproduction. Here, his painting gets erased after each one use, that is after six days, every week. Eight paintings every week it gets erased. It's, it's a pre-cinema practice. So why it survives in Bombay? In, in 21st century, it, 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 this shot is taken in 2004. In 2004, when Bombay was the first international city to go completely digital cinema. By 2005, it was impossible to screen a cellular uh, film. Even old films which are not digitized could not be printed. Very interestingly, this is the space now we come to, that this studio that you see there is a, a, a now surviving only eight theaters within one kilometer. But there were 20 such theaters which are actually older than theater. They are a demarcated area called Playhouse. Our British government, colonial government, wanted it to be London. So they had a district called a Playhouse, which Indians could not pronounce, so they called it Pila House. And in that area, the, all the low moral entertainment, that is circus, uh, cabaret, and red light area were uh, there. And then when cinema came, so naturally cinema came there. So first 20 theaters in Bombay came up there. So then it was red light area, circus slowly went off, and those circus tents only turned into cinema. The, this studio is in one of that theaters. So it is actually old, more than 100 years old theater, and it is uh, older than cinema, which now shows cinema. So it was first circus, then performances, then uh, silent cinema, then talkie, and it's still surviving. It still have three shows every day. They cannot show any digital film because they're too old a theater to be converted. And uh, so they show the uh, film prints which are discarded by other distributors or which are forgotten in some corner. They bring, bring them and show them to the migrant wage workers.
because the ticket prices are hundred times lower than the any other other theater. It's ten rupees if anybody understand Indian currency here. There you need a very unique skill of hand painted paint, uh, painting, uh, a hand painted banner because digital. Um, Publicity material is not available for those films. Nobody remembers those films. Those are 60s, 50s films. Uh, only these people have prints to circulate, and they need somebody like Rahman. So these theaters, these film prints, and the skill like this hand, uh, hand painting banner, uh, these are all crevices, nieces, um, uh, opposition to the rule of cinema culture and urban culture. So I want to place this story as a cinema and space story. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Maru. So when we sum up, and I think this is extremely interesting to, to look at Bombay as uh, the place where you have usually everyone from outside India completely impressed by numbers, numbers of tickets being sold in Bombay or, you know, a big Bollywood film today releases with, for instance, 5,000 prints. This is unheard of and everyone in the West gets a complete shell shock. Um, but when, when we get an understanding from Madhu's side of looking at Bombay as, uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes compared maybe also for good reasons to New York, except that the migrants who come to Bombay are from on, most of them are coming from only inside of India. One has, one looks at a very specific society that is this short circuit. And I would like to ask uh, Madhu to uh, round up her presentation now that we have worked, who makes the films, who watches the films. And for that, Cinema City, the big interdisciplinary project, also uh, can provide some very nice stills, which we are going to see now. And Madhu would explain to us um, who watches this film and what kind of demands have you found out uh, over your research that are very specific. So what kind of movies would they like to see? Thanks. Um, you know, um, I'll come with a shock element first, that there is a very um, significant number of people who live in that city, city of Bombay, and they don't know watch Bombay cinema. And they are diehard um, cinema audience. Uh, they are the migrant workers, wage workers, um, mostly unauthorized, not illegal, but unauthorized, I mean, unorganized, unauthorized who are brought from the other states of, uh, uh, around Bombay, which don't speak the same language as Hindi, which is the main language of uh, Bombay cinema. Not that they do, can't follow it, they can, but the kind of living they live is that um, they share, uh, they rent a bed, eight hours. So for eight hours, they can sleep on that bed, and the next eight hours, somebody else sleeps on that bed. So for 16 hours a day, they actually don't have an address. And not every day they get work. So when they don't get work, then they have 16 hours to kill somewhere. And if they get work, then they get, go to work. Where do they go? These are called popularly as slum cinema. It's, it's a bad name. Earlier, they used to call video parlor. That was a better name. So they go there, again, a 10 rupees ticket, they can stay there, they can watch a film. If they don't want, want to watch a film, they can lie down, they can sleep, and say you need two masons and one electrician. You can go there and tell the uh, theater um, cinema owner, I want two masons and one, one electrician. They will go inside the hall and ask for two masons, one electrician, they will come out. They will get their job. If they don't get their job, if you don't hire them, they go back to the cinema. I'll show you some photographs. Can we see the photographs, please? They look like any other shop. It could be a tea shop. It could be a coconut water shop. Uh, it could be. Uh, yeah, next. Is this kind of neighborhood? It's always. Um, on, on, on your way to the uh, metro station or bus stand, but you will never notice them. You know, these, these are public place, but it's somehow invisible. That's the culture that uh, we, middle class people like me, mainstream people like me, I always miss it unless I started doing this research, but they're always actually in the public domain. Next, please. 
but it, it, it has this ability to be invisible in a visible place, in a public place. Next. Next, please. So it's a community center. It, it, is the, it is the place to speak your own language. Next. Next. Now, this is what I want you to watch. Now, very interestingly, as you can see, it's very rudimentary. It's sometimes a bad projector, and sometimes it is even a television set. They don't have no control over the uh, daylight, um, sunlight coming in. So sometimes you can hardly see anything. But what is very interesting, the speakers are very good. And uh, so only way actually people like us come to know that there is a cinema hall here is because suddenly a language that I don't know, uh, but very d melodramatic, you know how Indian films are, melodramatic uh, um, revenge dialogue or some songs, uh, love songs are being played in a unnecessarily heavy, uh, loud uh, volume and you realize there's a cinema hall. So my take on it, and I am ready to be corrected, that one thing is these films are actually, again, people have watched it many a times, these are like mythical. So everybody knows the story, everybody knows the dialogue by heart. So they don't need to see it. But the comfort level, that these are the languages which are not generally spoken in Bombay. These are not the languages where, when they go out to work in the construction um, site, this is not the language they are given instruction to. But they long for that, that language. They are here not with their families, so they don't get to speak or hear their languages. So it is also a place which is more like a sound cinema. You want to hear the sound of the cinema made in your language. So it's, it's again a very interesting urban culture niche that this whole theater is. Yeah. Thank you very much, Madhu. Uh, I think <laughs> I think what, what becomes very clear is that those people who select or curate the cinema program in these kind of slum cinemas do have different criteria than, for instance, when we sit uh, at our selection committees and look for which is the best film for the forum or competition. And, and I really think uh, it is a very nice way of looking at uh, cinema is such a vast world and there are good films for this audience and good films for that audience and that it's not like this thing, I don't know, I, I sometimes get really tired of somebody saying, oh, a good film is a good film. I think what, what you uh, would consider a good film might be something else than what maybe my colleagues sometimes and myself would consider a good film for the forum than what Madhu has just um, shown to us, what is a good film for the people who come and see films over there. So that was like the basic uh, idea that we had in mind of opening up this debate when it comes to the Indian perspective. Now I move over to Jean-Pierre. Jean-Pierre, prolific filmmaker as Andrea has introduced him. I would also like to label him a very radical filmmaker. So he is known to always stir up debates and saying things that nobody else likes to say. This year we have a film that unfortunately we could squeeze in the program only once because it's a little bit long. It's a four hour documentary, Les Mots et les Choses de Modimbe. He's a Congolese uh, literacy professor and radical filmmaker, I mean in that sense, not only because that is a very long film, which when I first saw it, by the way, flew by like 10 minutes because it's so thought provoking. Um, but it's also a film where he confined to space ex um, exclusively to the house of this professor. He's, uh, and, and I think there are many ways uh, that Jean-Pierre could elaborate on that, of him being an exile, so an exile Congolese being refined to his house where he collects artifacts from his entire academic political life. But uh, we have decided for this session to take an excerpt from the previous film that Jean-Pierre has made, which caused major waves in Cameroon, where we have a completely different cinema situation as in, in India. 
Like most of you would know that uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, we have fewer screens than in Berlin. So how do you produce cinema in an environment where you have hardly any cinema left? So that is a very, very basic question. How do people consume films and what kind of films are they consuming? What can they pay for? What kind of production background is there? And in order not to embark in the whole entire field, we thought it might be interesting to look at Jean Pierre's uh, second but last film, Le Président, as a film that has created a lot of debate in Cameroon because he has entered the sphere of a political um, satire. So that film never says that this is a film about the still ongoing president of Cameroon. His name is Paul Bouya, and he's been sitting, I hope I'm, I'm not getting in trouble if I'm saying so. So you, I, I don't make you saying it, and when, if I don't get a visa, if I ever want to go to Cameroon, then <laughs> what to do? But I think this guy really has been sitting in office for too long. 32 years. Yeah. So it's basically, is it still a democracy, yes or no? And uh, the atmosphere described in Cameroon is that you have a full-on generation who doesn't know, you know, that it is possible to have another president than this one. So his film is very much about what kind of a life people live in, in a country that is only used to one president. And the scene that got him in most trouble, if I'm not mistaken, is that this president has had a wife. Now, the first wife passed on into another life, and Jean-Pierre was courageous enough to arrange a meeting for, what, uh, for a character in his film, who is very clearly so uh, the president in charge, and he's meeting his deceased wife in what looks like the, the heavens above us. Hell. Or hell. So, okay, can, can we see the, the clip? Or do you want to add something for the introduction of the film before? Okay, so uh, can we see, please have uh, Le Président.
So, Jean-Pierre, if we are not focusing for once on the difficulties when it comes to infrastructure, financing, da da da, when it comes to producing African cinema, I would like you to focus on the political space that you work in and how would you define it and how do you try to expand it? Okay. okay. Hello. Hi. Um, this film is a little bit special because it's a film I um, made after living abroad for quite a while and then I, I got back to Cameroon. So it's another space. <laughs> like living from France where I was based, going to Cameroon and um, and the feeling was that I, um, I really had to make a film uh, that really kind of give me, a, how can I say, like a photograph of the place. Um, and for me to be able to do that, I, um, uh, I picked maybe a topic. It was not that it was sensitive, it's that the way people think became strange, meaning, um, People don't project themselves. They didn't project themselves anymore. So it was like um, when you start thinking about the future, and obviously the president is like, I always say like you have God, you have the president, and then you have Jesus. Because when the president signs something, your life changes, for good or for bad. So people, they don't just praise him. I think he's really like, uh, in people's mind, the one who does, who makes things happen and who destroys things. And the problem was that uh, that figure uh, has so much um, uh, presence, even when he's not there, that I felt that that's really what is, the, 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 some, that's something to deal with, really. Uh, and um, people don't think about the future. Like when you say tomorrow, like, if the president is not there, say, no, 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 don't talk about it. Like, you know, you, you, have, you can speculate, he's 82 years old. So when you start thinking that in case he's not there, what happened? People ask, what is your problem? Why are you looking for trouble? So projecting oneself become almost like, um, uh, come on, this uh, uh, not, uh, Ça devient presque la dissidence de, 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 de te projeter, en fait. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it, it's really that once you start, not even foreseeing the death, as soon as you start imagining the future with him, people feel like, uh, actually, the, the law says, attempt à la sécurité de l'État. So it's like you are attempting to the, the state security because you imagine that this guy could die at 82. There's another law that they call it uh, mise à mal de la paix, like you're threatening peace. Just because you, can, you, you are suggesting that an 82 years old man could pass away. So this film is not like science fiction to imagine the future. <laughs> it's kind of obvious, everybody, you don't have to be a genius to think that an 82 years old man can go. And the title of the film was The President, How Do You Know It's Time to Go? And some people ask me, so how do you know? I was like, when you visit a friend. You know, you, you, if the friend asks you to leave, it means that you stay too long. So obviously, something like this should come from himself. Like, you know, this is just too, too long. But um, in the filmmaking process, I, um, I, I, there's something I try to shift. Um, because living abroad and coming back, my feeling was that it would be good to make a film, not for an audience somehow, uh, I mean, a little bit, but not that much, but from a place. Because it was really like, when you are there now, like from that place, okay, what are the elements that are critical? And um, uh, obviously I had to capture that ambience of uh, overwhelming, but at the same time invisible president, because he's never there. He spent, I think, half of the year in Switzerland. You know, so, uh, so he likes to be president in a country he doesn't like, actually. <laughs> so that invisibility and visibility at the same time, um, 
with all the kind of speculation about uh, what he's doing, what he's planning. Uh, so it's just taking too much space, in my opinion. And I felt that uh, it's, it would be important to kind of bring it up because this film cannot tell Cameroonian what the president is about. They, they know him more than anybody, you know. For many of them, since they were born, he was president. So it was not about telling if it's good or bad, it's good or bad or what. It was actually just to, to put this object there and that would make them uh, kind of bring out whatever they have in mind. Um, and even the way the film was done, a lot of things are not finished or complete because he's still there. So uh, it was not about like making clear statement about him doing this or that. It was mainly to, 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 to have something that will at least give an opportunity for projection to, to think about the future, to project, to leave where the, the space they are, to get into a space that is the future. Because the, the, the future is also an issue actually, um, not just for, for, for Cameroon, but I think uh, when it comes to Africa, that future thing is very important because I experienced many cases where when you ask young people what they see, either they see New York or they see whatever, wherever they are. But at the same time, not being able to see a space of the future is how can you get something you cannot see? So for me, the fact that they don't see the future is like there will be no future. It's like it doesn't cost much just to see something to imagine. The fact that cinema is supposed to be that space that is allowing us to go anywhere, like it's just, uh, and, but still, um, uh, we've had, we're having even ourselves filmmaker trouble to actually go there. So I felt that it was important to create this film that w would at least, you know, trigger, let's say, uh, the, the, the ability to, 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 to move and to live mainly the, the space, people are kind of stuck, you know, because uh, um, the feeling is that people are stuck in a space, they were put in a place, what is a country? You know, Cameroon means Rio dos Camaroes shrimps. Ro Camaroes, Camarons. So we are shrimps. And, and somebody has decided that we are shrimps and we still shrimps today. Like, nobody's really challenged, or, I don't know, but just like, we're stuck in a space that or like maybe colonial, but we perpetuate it. And any projection becomes like a real, real challenge. So um, obviously this film was to deal with this thing in a very confrontational, if you can say that, because um, uh, the, the reaction were very, very interesting. Um, beside the fact that he's not allowed to talk about it, but it was mainly to see how um, uh, people around me started like running away. But that's obvious, I mean, that was predictable. Um, but it was mainly uh, the idea that um, you, how can I say this? Um, like, I, I think about, because I tried to do a screening in Cameroon, uh, and I, I put a screening in a very rich neighborhood where you have a lot of ministers and people, important people, and I sent some SMS to some of these people. Uh, obviously, they never, nobody came. But one minister called and said, what is this about? And I said, it's a film. Uh, he said, what is the title? I said, the president. You know, and so what? So I said, you have to come and see if you want to know more. And then his reaction was that, so you want people to go tell the old man, the president, that I was part of the people who are seeing how it's going to end up, how it's going to finish. So I discover that most of them first didn't know what the film was about, but they all could tell you the story of the film. And at the same time, all the behavior was completely conditioned by what this guy would think or the privilege they are into and how. So, and you kind of see that it, maybe this is a film, but everything else works the same. So there's a kind of paralysis, like the whole country is paralyzed because of 
maybe this long lasting, actually a friend of mine called it perpetual government, you know, because yeah. in many of the places, you, know, you know, he's president for 30, 35 years, the other one 42, and then the sun takes over, and then, so the idea that um, uh, African government, some of, a lot of them, I mean, Gabon, in Togo, Zimbabwe, the idea of the perpetual government, like, you know, we don't, we don't change this thing. So, um, uh, obviously, a film, Cameroon is a place where they don't respect film, really, like, uh, you, actually, I could even shoot, like, nobody cares, it's like, irrelevant, you know, they don't really know, a lot of them don't even know, they see just like, it's maybe something for the kids to play with and everything. So, um, uh, by bringing cinema, like, at the very heart of uh, something very sensitive, for, for me, it was um, uh, first to kind of redefine cinema from that place, like, based on that context, really, like, to say uh, it's not about making a film, using a recipe, a formula, about anything. It's just to try to see uh, what is happening. And in the film also, one of the things... Um, uh, the, the people, because you have the power, and then the people. And the people are mainly represented by these guys on motorcycles. Because the motorcycle, taxi motorcycles, is like a big phenomenon in Cameroon. Uh, uh, first, there are Chinese motorcycles, they're very cheap. So it's like for 300, 200 euros, you get one. On a, all the people unemployed just get a motorcycle and start doing a taxi. Uh, and it's also like uh, those are the people that everybody think any revolution or every protest big will come from. So it's at the same time many things. And the, the, these motorcycles, which are on a kind of space that is has no law almost, like, uh, are like uh, really for me. It looks like so romantic paradise, like an elderly couple on a river that, uh, just to sum up a little bit what Jean-Pierre has been saying, the scene, you know, looking at the president being heaven was, of course, interpreted uh, Jean-Pierre wishes him dead or to pass on into that beautiful scenery, um, was the reason why uh, actually not the film was not only not released uh, officially, but also, for instance, it caused a major political scandal um, when even the Maison Française uh, refused to, Institut Français refused to show the film for being afraid of, you know, ruining the ties, the uh, political ties between Cameroon and France. So that is, you know, to show one excerpt of a clip and it's explosiveness, uh, even without it being shown. That is where maybe we can stop for a moment, come back to, to that particular uh, setup in Cameroon and, you know, what to do with cinema actually uh, in such a absolutely suffocating environment. Um, but now I would like to come to Sebastian and Amalia, as you can see, is translating <laughs> a lot. Um, Sebastian has made uh, the film Sifoy, El Lugar del Manduré. Manduré. Um, the film that is in Berlinale Natives. It's a film that is two years old by now. Uh, and it depicts Vichy, 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 Wiki culture in the northwest region of Argentina. And uh, the film is uh, one that we very much wanted to have here because we are now, after we've left the very concrete level of work situation, uh, work perception, the political space, we are now going into having a film uh, that takes the debate that we are talking about, how films are made, even to that level that it's the very topos of the film or one of the subject matters of the film. In, um, in this kind of movie uh, that was formerly called ethnographic filmmaking, it has always and ever since the beginning been a major issue um, how do we approach, we as filmmakers, our subjects? So, the, the protagonists, as we would say today. And I think most of you would agree that the time when the all-knowing Western white god is moving on into some faraway country and explains to Western audiences uh, what this particular culture is all about, luckily are long gone. 
But what has been uh, the case ever since is that filmmakers need to redefine. I mean, how do we go with the, uh, with the fact of the situation that a lot of indigenous people don't have access to make movies on their own. And fact is that it's still people who come from the outside trying to come in to that particular society and making a film about them and about their culture. And that was, uh, I think, one of the reasons of uh, Sebastian not being afraid of addressing this very sensitive issue in his film, that the film, for instance, won the jury prize of the FIT Marseille Film Festival. And I don't know, Sebastian, if you want to say something more for the introduction uh, of the scene where you have the conversation between Gustavo, like maybe who Gustavo is and how you collaborated. Bueno, eh, sí, la, bueno, Gustavo es un amigo, eh, me hice amigo de Gustavo este, haciendo una película anterior y lo conocí a partir de una amiga que, que está acá presente, que es María Paz Bustamante, eh, que es de Chaco y que lo conoce a Gustavo desde que, desde que era niña, digamos. Entonces eh, se dio en, ese, en un marco de amistad la película. So, um, first of all, thank you. And, uh, well, Gustavo, Gustavo is a friend. Um, I actually knew him from my previous film, and he was a friend of the scriptwriter Maria Paz Bustamante, who's here, and she's also, uh, she's actually from the Chaco region, and she's known Gustavo um, since she was a girl. So, I would say that the framework of this relationship is friendship. Y... Hay una cosa importante es que la película, la idea de hacer la película es de Gustavo y incluso nosotros, eh, digamos, le, le, le llegamos a proponer si la quería dirigir él y él prefirió que, que la dirigiera yo. Este, yo, bueno, vengo del, del mundo académico, digamos, de, de la educación, digamos, del cine, entonces, este, este, bueno. So, um... The idea initially was to make the film about Gustavo, and we actually proposed that he direct it, but he preferred that I direct it, even though I don't come from, you know, this academic world, I come from the film world. Bueno, una, perdón, voy a decir una cosita que es que tomé mucho café <laughs> antes de entrar y me, me tiembla un poco las manos, pero es porque tomé mucho café. Sorry, I'm a little shaky. I had a lot of coffee before I walked in here. So um, I think it might be a good moment to, to look at the clip. So the clip is a little bit into the picture. The film is only a little more than an hour long. And here we have selected a short scene in which um, we hear more than we see uh, a dialogue between uh, Sebastian and his friend Gustavo. Please, can we have the next excerpt?
Bueno, eh, les cuento un poco cómo surge este diálogo. Eh, en principio, eh, nosotros teníamos la película sobre relatos orales de la cultura wichí y queríamos darle un, digamos, un contexto o también un conflicto, en todo caso. Este, y entonces... Eh, eh, y entonces lo que, digamos, do, donde encontramos el, el, digamos, el punto central de la película fue en las conversaciones que teníamos entre María Paz, que es la guionista, Gustavo, bueno yo, pero además con, to, con el resto de la comunidad. ¿no? Entonces, a partir de, digamos, de esas conversaciones re, reales, este, dijimos, bueno, eh, ficcionemos un poco, sería la parte más, de más ficción de la película este, y, este, bueno, y, y hagamos la escena este, y bueno eh, la, la conversación es entre Félix, que es uno de los actores de la película y Gustavo Salvatierra So let me tell you a little bit about the origin of this dialogue We um, wanted to make a story about the oral stories, the oral tradition of the Wichi. And we wanted to give a context, but we also wanted to give a conflict. So the main points that we found originated in actual conversations held between Maria Paz, Gustavo, the protagonist, myself, and the rest of the community. And there we agreed that we would uh, fictionalize some parts of this And that's when the idea for the scene came up. This is a conversation between Felix and the protagonist, Gustavo Salvatierra. Um, I was uh, very, very impressed by the way of uh, you entering this, as I said, sensitive territory of going somewhere where people actually try to protect themselves, their culture, uh, by not claiming it's not sensitive territory, but by boldly putting it into the center of, of your film. And I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit more about your work method, uh, like when it also comes to issues, you were mentioning the financial aspect. Uh, have you ever considered of paying your protagonists, for instance, or what kind of paying back that is uh, part of the conversation or what you addressed in, how you deal with these uh, issues? Bueno, es que sí, justamente eso era lo que, lo que sucedía, ¿no? Se hablaba de plata y nosotros, este, lo que, o sea, queríamos hacer esto por fuera del sistema capitalista, por decirlo de alguna forma. Este, y creo que una clave es entender que quizás cierto sistema de poder... Eh, que digamos, esta idea de proteger las cosas, los conocimientos, pasa tanto en la cultura wichí como en la cultura occidental. Este, de hecho, en la cultura occidental hay un montón de secretos que el pueblo no, no conoce, porque ciertas personas de poder no quieren que se, se, se dé a conocer eso. E incluso en el sistema educativo hay muchas diferencias también. Y lo mismo sucede en la cultura wichí, digamos. Es como que el sistema de poder se reproduce en, en casi todas las culturas de la misma forma. Exactly. Um, we actually did talk about money, but um, personally, we wanted to do it outside of the capitalist system, outside of that scheme of money. And that was the key, to do this outside of the uh, mercantile system. And there was this knowledge that uh, is protected, And that happens not just in the Wichi, it also happens in Western society. Here in the West, there is also secrecy in spheres of power. And it seems to me that this um, secrecy, uh, it's a system that's reproduced in, in all places where the power takes over. Sí, digamos, eh, fue una, eh, di, básicamente el diálogo eh, plantea la tensión o el conflicto que vivimos haciendo la película. Por eso es que la película quizás está más cercana al documental, pero tiene mucho de ficción, porque algunas cosas recreamos de... de... Pero fue algo muy, este, muy, este, eh, 
muy natural y muy vivo, este, muy intenso el rodaje en ese sentido. Eh, había momentos de mucho conflicto también, pero eran momentos puntuales en donde, digamos, justamente la idea de, 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 este, de como, eh, digamos, de la, de la amistad, de, de ay, no me sale la palabra, la, bueno, claro, la colaboración, digamos, es como que finalmente la, la idea natural de de llevar adelante las cosas hizo que todo fluyera mejor, digamos, que todo funcionara mejor. O sea, como en el mejor interés de todos, de, de por lo grande, de la fin último de la película. Sí. So, yes, um, I think this conversation in the clip that we just saw reflects uh, quite well some of the tensions that we faced while actually making the film. Um, there were, I guess in that sense, you could say that this is more documentary than fiction, although we did have scenes that we recreated. Um, but the whole process was very natural, very alive, very organic, but also with a lot of intensity. There were a few moments of, you know, conflict, but, you know, in the spirit of, and he was searching for this word, but, you know, he came up with, like, friendship, collaboration, we found ways to move forward, and I asked him, you know, for the greater good of the project, and he said, yes, for the greater aims that, that the project have. Sí, la palabra era confianza. Oh, so the word I'm looking la for? La confianza en el otro, digamos. Is trust. La the trust in the other. Sí. Thank you very much. Um, so this was, um, you know, barely a surface scratch of trying to get an understanding in which kind of space these very different, distinguished filmmakers work in, how they make use of uh, traditions that some of them they might hate, others that are very stimulating and, and uh, nice, that actually produce stories. I would now like, uh, of course, also to open up, and if you have comments or commentaries, other than that, we have enough to talk here, but just raise your hands if something comes up that you would like to know already now. Okay, I already see a question. Yeah, this is, this is working. Okay, I've got two questions. Um, one is to the three of you, and, and the th second one is to the Argentine filmmaker. So the first one is, um, how did um, or have some sort of um, local ways of storytelling, maybe oral storytelling, I influenced your films in a way that you wanted to distance yourself from them or that you got some inspiration from them? Um, so I'm very curious about that. Um, and the question to the Argentine filmmaker is that um, I, I've been to Argentina several times and I find it so interesting that it's always presented by, by the outside, maybe Europe, but also Argentina itself as a very white country, so that they, they've kind of um, wiped out the indigenous or, or the black population. and. Um, Mm, so, so, so Argentina itself presents itself almost as, as a sort of European country that does not have these indigenous elements and I would like to have your opinion on that um, as an Argentine person, um, how you can deal with this force that Argentina wants to present itself as, as a white and non-indigenous country. Maybe we have uh, Sebastian answering the second question first, and meantime, the others can think of a smart answer to the first question. Sí, en la Argentina eso que decís es real, pero bueno, es un mito. Eh, no, no es así. Eh, seguramente la población este, que tiene el color de piel más, digamos, la población que desciende de Europa de manera más directa está en Buenos Aires y en las capitales de otras partes, pero, pero no es así. Y no solamente eso, sino que 
toda la cultura argentina está atravesada por la cultura indígena. Este, hay eh, las tonadas argentinas, palabras que usamos, la palabra che, por ejemplo, es una palabra muy argentina, viene del mapuche. Este, estamos atravesados por la cultura indígena, somos, venimos de ahí, yo incluso tengo eh, cierta parte indígena también, este, por ahí si la, si la ven a mi mamá o a mi hermana se van a dar cuenta mejor, pero, pero es así, entonces es un mito que que poco a poco se está rompiendo y, y está bien, es parte de, es, es, es evolución porque en definitiva nos va a hacer mejor, una mejor cultura. Well, the impression you have is, is true, this impression of Argentina presenting itself like that, but it's also true what you say, it is a myth. Um, the population of Argentina um, is descended from indigenous Uh, peoples and perhaps in places like Buenos Aires you will see more European descent but not everywhere. All of Argentina is like across the board penetrated by indigeneity. You can see it in our songs and the tonadas, you can see it in the way we talk. Uh, the word che is an indigenous word, it's a Mapuche word. So um, we all come from there and even uh, my family is, is has that root as well. If you saw my mother, if you saw my sister, you would you know, see the indigenous roots. So it's definitely a myth, but it's a myth we can, we can break. And if we break this and, and evolve, we can uh, become a better culture. So if we then come to the first question uh, that was raised, maybe uh, I allow it to be a little bit broader than its only oral storytelling and uh, if you could relate to that, but also maybe to the fact that I've heard times and again, not only African filmmakers, but also Indian filmmakers, uh, to say, well, oh, we like to talk so much. And then, for instance, some of you might be uh, part of the script station and you are advised, well, cut down the dialogue. So to break down your question even a little bit more on the practical filmmaking level, um, how, how do you see, uh, the oral tradition as in the oral tradition in general and the oral tradition when it comes to filmmaking and looking at traditional ways of storytelling in Indian as well as in Cameroonian or Sub-Saharan African cinema. I'm not ready. Never mind. Okay. Um, uh, you know, um, Five years back, if you asked me this question, I would have been ready with an answer, but not anymore. Um, things get complicated, actually, as you grow older. Uh, <laughs> but the um, thing is that I make documentary films, and actually this question is more relevant to documentary, that how much a documentary can take the local oral culture like oral culture is not only storytelling, local culture is also a practicing culture, a practicing uh, way of um, talking about memories, which has a very, very important uh, role in all sorts of documentary filmmaking, and also uh, which is not codified, which is not in official information, which is not in official history, which are only remembered through oral culture. So it's very relevant to that. And I don't think that it is really land-specific or nation-specific or language-specific, but it's people-specific. That older generation, older women, remember things in a, uh, in a different way. If I'm making a documentary or a fiction with a character like that, I must understand that rhythm. The way, say, a 20 years old who is um, very active in social media, will give an interview or opinion on certain things. An uh, older woman who comes from a different communication um, science uh, will speak in a completely different rhythm and in a different texture. Uh, and I uh, that I should be uh, able to adopt it. It's nothing to do with Indian or African. It is the, who, who is your protagonist or who is your uh, fictional character? But why I say that it is not so comfortable, uh, I'm not so comfortable to say this anymore, because when we say that from your specific 
culture. You know, it's, it's become very problematic because there is all over the world, but especially in my country, in India, in last few years, especially last one year, we have come to a point when we wear our national specificity on our sleeves. It's put on us that it ha Indian cinema has to be Indian, Indian language has to be Indian, Indian women should wear Indian clothes. Uh, these kind of things which, which has its positive points, like indigenous people should have um, access to their knowledge and protection to their knowledge. But at the same time, on the other hand, it comes from the state kind, with a kind of cultural mandate about national culture is, is, is extremely derogatory. I would rather be a cultural activist, a filmmaker who lives in India and who shoots in India, rather than how do you make Indian films. Um, I mean, sometimes it's necessary to do it, to assert uh, identity uh, within the cultural uh, action, but most of the time, actually, it's a very, very dangerous trend. I, am, am I clear? I mean, uh, to me, say? yes. I would, even, I, would, I would like to pick up on what Maru mm -hmm. just said and ask, and, and I don't know what, what are your experiences, but uh, I hear between the lines what Maru has just said, that she's also addressing this backlashy thing, and I, I think some of you might have had this experience that particularly when you come from a non-Western culture, culture, you're forced into making an Indian film. Now what is an Indian film for an Indian audience is something else than what, for instance, festivals think is a good Indian film, and that might be something that uh, would lead us into, you know, how much is this oral history, or in how much are the traditions a burden, yeah. and how much is it like a source of, yeah. uh, you know, inspiration? I don't know what is your opinion, or if maybe Jean-Pierre you want to say? Yeah, it can be also a kind of revisionist politics, mm -hmm. which actually India is going towards uh, uh, at this moment. I mean, if any Indian is here in the audience, they know who, what I'm talking about, uh, that it's a particular culture that pre-Western, pre-colonial. Now, post-colonial has also become pre-colonial. So pre-colonial means everything is Indian and that was everything good. Pre-modern means everything that time was good. It's a, it's a very, and India is not the only country. I mean, many Arabic country has gone, gone into that kind of thing. And cinema has no reason to uh, escape this kind of um, divisionist local politics. So in the name of local oral culture, we should not also subscribe to that trend. Okay. Uh, I mean, my, my feeling, because uh, it's true, everything I agree with everything here, it's just that to make it simple, I just think anybody should be free to make any film the way he wants. No rules, like okay, yeah, oral traditions. Maybe this is oral tradition, because we're not writing here, we're talking. What is oral, what is not. Um, uh, the word writing exists in all the languages of Cameroon. In Cameroon, you have 280 languages. And the word writing exists, but people were not writing. <laughs> so I'm just saying um, uh, it's just uh, too complicated to really work on forcing kind of you to be who you're supposed to be for who, it's very complicated. And the film of Mudimbe actually, uh, that was shown yesterday I made is, uh, I, Mudimbe is known because he, he wrote this book, I mean, for many other things, but this book called The Invention of Africa. Okay. Meaning Africa is a Western invention. Which means that when you talk about Africa, it's actually a dialogue between the West and the West. Africans are not part of it really. So I think uh, even that idea of oral tradition is still a kind of invention somehow. It's a perception um, which, where the expectation of making a certain type of films. Uh, and I really think cinema, I'm approaching it in a very individual way, like uh, my film look like me. <laughs> so, and I don't even know if I look like my community or if I really have, uh, I'm defending something collective in that sense. So I think it's a very personal experience uh, of trying to just do something and having people trying to follow you, so something like that.
And I mean, just as one, one word, as a curator, I, I think a life like Jean-Pierre is leading, when, whenever I speak to him, I never know whether he's in France or US or at some airport. And still, uh, in order to apply for official funding, everyone wants a typical African film. Now, uh, <laughs> this is a, a serious, serious conflict that I think not only um, Jean-Pierre is pained by throughout your filmmaking career to, to bridge this gap. But please, are there more questions, commentaries? I don't know who, whoever gets the microphone first. Um, hello, I'm here. I'm, uh, in fact, I just want to add on what you're, what you're talking about now. I'm, my name is Roy. I'm a Lebanese filmmaker. Uh, and in fact, I'm not Lebanese. I'm just a filmmaker from Lebanon. And this is, this is really a serious problem. And I think that the problem here exists in the, uh, in fact, this problem, and let's be frank about it, exists in the West and exists in uh, people on the other side who decide to fit in the West agenda or discourse or, uh, or like what we're all we're talking about. Last year I participated in the festival in the Berlinale and was so happy as I'm this year too. And I won for my short film the Teddy Award. And in fact, technically it happened that I am the first Arab to win a Teddy Award, which is the most prestigious queer award. And I've refused during the whole year, last year, with all the media in Lebanon I'm talking and in the Arab world, uh, to be announced as the first Arab queer film, uh, film awarded. It was like, I don't really care, like I don't represent the Arab world, I don't represent Lebanon, I present my work and my, like, it's just what I'm doing is presented in my film. So I'm, I'm not interested in, in, in this, adding this, um, this labeling to, to, to a film. And in fact, this is, this is a problem because uh, it's for, for all filmmakers coming from uh, non-West countries, uh, they have to work very hard and like for many years to be to, st to be start looking at them as as a filmmaker and not as a Lebanese filmmaker, a Chinese filmmaker, a like to to, to get rid of the nationality. Uh, you you need to prove a lot, which is not asked of any other filmmaker coming from from a Western country. So yeah, I just want to add this. Thank you. Can I add something here? Also, you know, just think about it. We are talking about local, we are talking about oral, but we are talking about cinema. And this bloody 120 years old, this young infant uh, art form, <coughs> uh, uh, what kind of local uh, languages it has developed. Anyway, it is so technology in, um, uh, dependent that it, it, languages also change with that. So it, I mean, it is not like literature or uh, visual art form that it will be so culture specific. There will be a chance of greater um, commonality between various culture of uh, film practices because it is only a very young infant um, art form which hasn't got its uh, local cultures um, evolved yet. I mean, cinema is yet to be evolved according to me. Yeah? It's only 120 years, nothing. I have a question for uh, Mr. John. So, sorry, sorry. Um, I think that. Uh, creo que es importante eh, una cosa que está pasando en el Nativ en relación a lo que dice el compañero, que es eh, hay un debate en el Nativ sobre eh, si el cine indígena lo tienen que hacer indígenas o si lo pueden hacer eh, no indígenas. Y justamente lo que En, bueno, en mi caso y en el de muchos más, que, que quizás es la diferencia entre la mirada del norte, la canadiense más que nada, y la de la Argentina, este, como distintas concepciones, es que en realidad hay que pensar a las películas, este, hay que, y no el color de piel o, o, el, o incluso la cultura de, 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 del que los hace, este, sino se, justamente, este, bueno, esto tiene que ver con encasillar, que es un problema, pero si no termina siendo también un problema de, como de racismo a la inversa, porque hay, por ejemplo, un festival 
el más importante festival de cine indígena, es solo para eh, eh, indígenas, eh, cineastas indígenas. Y, digamos, el, me parece que el problema es eh, no reproducir los conceptos. Eh, digamos, si la cultura occidental durante décadas fue racista, siglos, digamos, fue racista, fue genocida, este, hay que, hay que eh, transformar eso, pero no, no reproduciendo lo mismo este, desde, desde el otro lado, digamos, justamente. In relation to what you just said, um, this debate also is something that um, is uh, very sensitive or very important for the native uh, section of the, the Berlinale. Um, and the debate is whether, you know, indigenous film can only be made by indigenous people. Um, there can be differing views, for instance, from the position in Canada and our reality in Argentina. And uh, we're advocating for the work, every piece of every audiovisual work to stand for its own value and not for the color of the skin of who made it. Otherwise, I believe there's a danger of ghettoizing and exercising a form of inverse racism. Um, there's a, the most important the largest uh, indigenous film festival, for instance, is in uh, Canada. And they only accept work produced, written, or directed by indigenous people. And I think uh, there's a risk of reproducing. I mean, the idea is to not reproduce uh, what Western culture has done, which has been you know, racist and genocidal. We need to change that. But we need to be careful to not reproduce those same, those same attitudes. I have a question for Mr. Jean Pierre. Um, I believe that it's impossible to be an artist without being an activist. So, how has your perception changed towards filmmaking after all those retaliations that you get for your film? And would you share your experience for the future filmmakers who want to make films that are brutally honest and uh, say the truth as it is? What would you share your experience that you go through after your films receive the kind of response that it does from people sitting at higher levels? Okay, well, thank you for that question because it's true that that's something I've been really thinking of. Like, what should I do next? Actually, this film, I, uh, I just, I'm just showing it. I, sh I shot it uh, because Dorothy was mentioning the fact that I had to leave for like some time because there were like a lot of stuff happening, one filmmaker disappeared, he was tortured, everybody thought it was me, I don't know if themselves thought it was me. Anyway, so I, um, uh, well, uh, so, and I decided to go, as I was spent like six months in South Africa, and then I went to North Carolina to shoot this film that is here on Mudimbe, uh, and then I edited, and then I came back. Um, what is true is that uh, at first I came back because I felt like if I just don't come, it would be too strange, first for myself and for what people would feel. So I just feel like it's better to face whatever and then I can move on. Um, Cameroon is a very strange country in that sense, you know, you, you really don't know much, you know, stuff. Uh, but at the same time, you also know. Um, th then I, um, uh, a lot of people don't, associate with you anymore because any association will make them lose whatever privilege they have in the system, which is good, then you have less people bothering you. Then uh, I started wondering what film should be next. And um, okay, I said I'll make this film called The Day After, meaning after the prisoner is gone. Okay. Uh, and I keep... When people ask me what is next, I say my next film will be called The Day After. Obviously, everybody's scared. He's like, oh. But I said, we have to know what you're going to do that day. Because, you know, he's been there 32 years. That day, how would you dress? Are you being, going to be in a jogging, ready to run, or dress in a suit? Are you going to take the back roads or the main road? Are you going to walk or take a car? But you have to know what's going to happen because at least at your own level, because we are in Africa, meaning any time this long-lasting president go, in Congo, 20 years of war, in Cote d'Ivoire, almost the same, 10 years of war, 
Uh, so the pattern is very clear. It's like it's a collapse of a whole world when this guy leaves. So conceptually, the idea of um, making a film to get people to, to at least not little things, it's not about a big system, it's about personally de personal decisions because most of the foreigners live in Cameroon, they always rehearse. Everybody who has a foreign passport knows that that day, this is the place we're going to meet so that the, the army will come and take us to, or whatever. So they have days of rehearsal already. So I think the day after should be the next film. But obviously, <laughs> I don't think I'll be able to shoot it really. <laughs> um, um, I, I, and then I decide maybe to do something more aesthetic. Um, uh, again, related to that day, the idea is that uh, most of the time when you have this situation, you have what they call cover few, cover few. Mm -hmm. So what I'm interested in is that when people are forced to kind of stay at the same place from six o'clock to the next six o'clock, so it's like if it happened that most of people end up in a bar and then they have to spend the whole night in the bar because they're not allowed to go out. So I'm trying to work on the idea how they're going to create a new culture from that bar because they had to stay together for the whole night. Because when they'll get out of the bar, the language will change, the way they dress, the way they talk. So it's that new culture that comes out of this kind of extreme condition. So that's one of the things I think will be more will be softer than, than the day after. <laughs> Uh, folks, it's 3.30, uh, I don't know, do we have five more minutes or do we, yeah? So one last question and then just to warn you, I know Madhu has to run, but maybe Jean-Pierre and Sebastian, I don't know if you have to run as well. Okay, so one last question in uh, the general public and then we come to an end. I saw more questions before, yeah? Test. Madhu, uh, <clears throat> I spent some serious time in Bombay and in India, and I, um, I see that, uh, that the rise of internet culture has, has um, really pushed or, or allowed access for, for a great many people to, to sample works from around the world, and with the democratization of, of the industry and equipment being made available to people. I'm wondering what you, uh, how you feel about um, the, the surge of documentaries that may come uh, in India and, and will there be, do, do, do you see a, a growing, like with the success of films like Indian Ocean, that documentary, and maybe John and Jane, Oshum Odawalia, do, do you see documentaries coming more and maybe funding opportunities coming more for the country of India and its people? Well, by law of nature, uh, funding opportunities grow because market grows, market needs different kind of taste. If every day they eat cookies, then one day they want to have some salty snacks. And so every day they, if they watch Bollywood, then one day they will, one day a week they will want to watch a political documentary. So market by nature of law will increase. Whether it increases to the way, way that I would like it to happen, of course not. Well, um, I'll tell you one thing that um, before John and Jane and before Indian Ocean in 2007, I released my film, Seven Islands and a Metro. So it is one of those success stories which makes no sense because the seven days or maybe two weeks that it runs in the theater is not the documentary audience. It neither makes the film visible uh, nor is it uh, make an audience for the uh, films. Rather than that, uh, Indian documentaries has a labyrinth of contacts through which it, it reaches pe people. You know, uh, in India, often documentary filmmakers are asked this question, but why do you make films? Who watches? And I'll tell you that as a marginal documentary filmmaker, my film is watched by more number of people who watch a fairly well-run European film, European feature film. It is the demography of my country that even if 50,000 people watch a film, you will say, who watches it? 
because 50,000, the three zeros and, uh, is not very important because it's always counted in the, in the context of one billion. So what do we think is a success is better? I think more or less Indian documentaries are success if you go by the number of people. If you go by the funding, funding is a very difficult question that some documentaries can be made without absolutely no funding. In fact, funding, funding may kill that the kind of documentary. And some documentaries deserve and must get a feature film level of uh, funding. So funding is not a generic question. You know, funding is, some people don't want, it's like some people don't want apps which can trace the, uh, on their phone, which can trace where they are. Some people don't want those apps. Some people don't want those funding. They want to uh, make films without any funding, nobody can be traced, no surveillance, no contact, nothing. So it's, it's a very, it, it cannot be answered fund, funding is good, funding is improving or not, because it's a very, very complex situation. There's nothing called documentary filmmaking, actually. There are many, many kinds of screen culture that comes broadly under, video art comes under that, um, all sorts of non-fictions on television come under that, so things have become very complex now. So coming to an end, I would like to say that, um, that I think uh, space, when we refer to the label that was discussed, uh, for me, I look up to all these three filmmakers because I find they show us very inspiring ways of how to deal creatively with these labels, because I don't think we have a chance of just letting go because we want to, maybe we all want to, but that doesn't mean that they will go. We have to live with them. And I hope you got as much inspiration as I did from the way of how Jean-Pierre, Madou and Sebastian deal with this, fight it, and try to outsmart it. Thank you all very much. Thank you for your interaction and a nice afternoon to everyone. Thank you. Only somebody like Dorothy Werner can walk through three continents with so much ease. Thank you very much. <laughs>